Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I'm Dory Mincer, host of the Fourth Tuesday Revolutionize Your Retirement interview with expert series to help you create a fulfilling second half of life. I want to welcome you all here, and I want to get going right now to introduce this wonderful guest that we have. Glenn Frank is the Director of Education at Lexington Wealth Management. He maintains the website timemoneyandjoy.com for his outside educational endeavors and to provide resources for his followers. As a financial advisor and educator for over 30 years, his work has centered on helping people maximize happiness within the confines of their personal time and financial limitations. Glenn received the 2019 Planner of the Year Award from the Massachusetts Financial Planning Association, and he was listed by Worth Magazine for 10 years as one of the top advisors in the U.S., In 1996, Professor Frank was the founding director of Bentley University Master's Program in Financial Planning. He's authored and has been interviewed for numerous articles, white papers, books, newspapers, and magazines, and is author of the book, Your Encore, Retirement Planning Guide, How to Balance Time, Money, and Joy. So I really want to welcome Glenn to be here, and I want to just mention how I learned about Glenn, and I want to thank Doug Dixon, who is a pioneer in the field of aging and currently with Encore Boston Network. It was through Doug that I learned about Glenn, and I remember when I read Glenn, when I read your book, and then I caught, we were in touch and talked about interviewing you, I mentioned this to all of you. It's not often that you read a book about financial planning that brings smiles to your face and gets you laughing because he has this wonderful way in this book where you know where he's talking about balancing time, money and joy where he he has and he'll tell you about these positive neurochemical breaks that he takes. He uses music so at the end of chapters you have YouTube links to listen to Garmin, sorry, Simon and Garfunkel, You Move Too Fast, and The Beatles, and Louis Armstrong. It's just, it's wonderful. So we're in for a treat, all of us, today, to hear about his model and plan of how to balance time, money, and joy. Welcome, Glenn. Hi, Dory. Hi, everyone. Very kind to spend some time here today. I am very envious, Dory. You have this incredible opportunity to chat with all the experts in the field, and I don't know if I'm one of them or not, but I am very envious. I'm delighted, excited. This is fun stuff. You you reference positive neurochemical breaks, a little acronym that I came up with, and I'll start off with my favorite. You call it the smiling starfish. So if everyone could indulge me for a couple of minutes, what I'd like you to do, and this will just set the mood for the for the interview, what I'd like you to do is have a very open stance. Get your arms up maybe, stretch your fingers, open your legs. And I got this idea from Amy Cuddy, if you've ever heard of her. And she did all this marvelous research on the impacts of having this open stance. And basically, she's concluded that if you have this open stance for a couple of minutes, it will reduce your cortisol, your stress levels, by 30%. It will improve your confidence. You're more likely to win that tennis match or get that job. And I thought, as long as I'm in the stance, I may as well do a few other things. So you throw the stretch in. That's good. Deep belly breaths, if you can work that in. Get that stomach going up and down. And why not? Throw a smile on top of it. You got all these positive neurochemicals cooking, and we're reducing cortisol. And this is actually, you might be aware, this is an old speaker's trick. So this is what I was doing actually before this call is I had this big open stance, and again, it uh, reduced my butterflies. In any case, what I'm hoping you do, so keep this on for a couple of minutes here. And Dory, so you read the book. Have you been doing this every every morning when you wake up? I do, and I wasn't quite that stance most mornings, but I do have my own kind of morning ritual practice, and I've been including this since I read your book, too. That's awesome. Yeah. No, and it makes a difference. I really do think how we get out of bed in the morning and how we embrace the world has a lot to do on how we deal with whatever, whether it be money, 
time, joy. And I think your whole focus on balance is such an important thing. I was thinking maybe it would be good if we could start with defining some of the terms that you use, because I know, although you talk about retirement at times, you also call it an encore. So I thought we could start with, with that term and why you use it and how you define it. Perfect. Perfect. And again, just to follow up on the smiling star piece, so my my request for everyone who's listening is tomorrow morning when you wake up, do just as Dory and I do, and don't pick up that, that, that darn phone. Do the smart, do the star pitch. So what's an encore? So I have a little definition. Folks are looking at the slide. It's an additional act given by performers after the planned show is ended for extended applause. Yeah, so what's, what comes next? I don't really like the term retirement. I'm not sure any of us really do. It, but encore is really, I think, on point. Yeah, so what's next? And something to be excited about, but at the same time, be practical. And I think one of the terms that I know Dory likes to use is realistic optimism. So that's what we're going to spend some time with today. So that's one of the terms. Great. And I know that you also, and I know it's one of your slides, there are three questions that you like people to ask themselves as they approach the planning stage. I think it would be helpful if you share that with people now, too. Absolutely. So the whole idea here is it's a pretty darn big decision. It's a tough one. There's so many different options out there. So we want you to be very explicit about it, very thoughtful about it. So basically, the three questions are, what will actually make you happy? How much time can you allot to it? And what can you actually afford financially? These are the three big questions, and I've got another slide here. Basically, it's an ongoing balancing act. Time and money are finite. Happiness is not. There's only so many dollars in our pockets and so many minutes in the day. We have to balance that with getting as much happiness as we can. So those are three big questions. We're going to dig into them a little bit here today and how to answer them. Can you, even before we get into the digging in, how did you get interested in, in developing this approach? Because I know you have so many years of being a financial planner. So what led you to think about time, money, and joy in the way that you do? Yeah, so I've always been a pretty, we've always claimed to be comprehensive financial planners, and that's what we all try to say and do. And so clients come to us over the years, and they want, it's always about optimizing some financial issue, when the truth is they really want to optimize overall family happiness. And you can't really do that unless you have all the facts, unless you really understand what makes them tick, what makes them happy. And sometimes these are areas that not all advisors are comfortable dealing with and not all clients are comfortable asking about. But I think it's, again, if you really want to call yourself a comprehensive financial planner, I don't know how you cannot get into understanding what may drive their happiness. And also a critical part of that is is even more precious than money is time, time slash choice management. So, yeah, I've been at this for a long time myself, and this seems really obvious a long time ago. In fact, I used to catch prospective employees would come in and they'd, they'd expect the traditional, what, where do you see yourself in five years kind of questions. And I would ask them about balancing time, money, and joy in their life and how that relates to the job. And it was interesting. So in any case, Dory, I've uh, been thinking about this and integrating it in for quite a while, but one more formally in the last few years. Great. And so how do you differentiate? I know you talk about there are different kinds of decisions. Some are more kind of implicit, some are explicit. Can you expand on that for our listeners? Yeah, here I'm talking to the psychologist about how our mind works, so this is funny. But in any case, I see it as a, I think most decisions are made emotionally. And we make these quick decisions and maybe we rationalize them later. The more thoughtful decisions are at least there's this implicit trade-off between time, money, joy. For example, our listeners here today, some of them probably, gee, I love Dory, I love the community, I'm signing up, and we're done. Others think a little more deeply, gee, can I spare the hour or not, and et cetera, et cetera, and there's this kind of implicit trade-off between time, money, joy. Still others, it's very explicit. I've got a busy Tuesday here, and can I carve out that hour or not? 
And even though there's no direct cost, there may be an indirect cost. I could have been billing X amount, or maybe there's a positive on the financial side. It's going to help me with my practice. And then bottom line, what's it going to do to my overall happiness to attend this one-hour session? And however you made the decision, you made the right one. You're here today. But my point is, I think people need to be very explicit when they come to these major decision points, such as, what am I going to do after I retire? And yeah, very intentional, very explicit, and getting into the details as deeply as necessary. I think there's a, there's an old quote by Einstein that I love. Everything should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. So let's keep it as simple as possible without compromising the results. So that's what I try to do, and, and I live by this. Let's take prudent shortcuts wherever we can. I don't know if that helps or not. That's really very helpful. And so what, I know sometimes I've heard you say the devil is in the details. What are some of the details that you think people really do need to be conscious and intentional of in this planning to to make it more explicit? It's a, a very classic. I've seen the people who fail retirement, they may budget things down to the dollar and in our, and not the least bit cognizant of time. So, for example, they they get the gold watch on Monday. And then on Tuesday, so what are you doing, John, at 9 o'clock, 9.30, 10, et cetera, et cetera? I'm not worried about it. I'll hit some golf balls, I'll go fishing, I'll learn to play the piano, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then suddenly, oh, my God, they no longer have any relevance. They don't have a reason to get up in the morning. They really didn't plan their time very well at all. So I think they really need to be introspective. They really need to understand themselves and really need to plan their time because if they don't, somebody else might for them. But, yeah, so it's the devil in details, and it's also truly understanding what makes you tick and what makes you happy, not other people. So a lot of self-reflection and self-awareness, which I tend to agree is really important. So what, from your work and thinking about kind of the interface of time, money, joy. What makes a retirement successful? You've just alluded to it a little bit. Can you expand and what would make it not so? Well, obviously, planning is key. Self-awareness is key. Yeah, it's just like any problem solved is you gather all the facts, which includes all the self-awareness. Then you do some analysis, play out some what-ifs, look at some alternatives and draw conclusions. And, And realizing that the facts may change later, but at least if you've made a thoughtful process in the first place, you can adapt to the change. But, yeah, it's just take your book, for example, Dory. How many couples really never sit down and there's 10 critical questions in your book and do they even get to one or two? And, and it's, that's huge. If you're not working, if you have a partner, it's absolutely huge to really reconcile. And it doesn't have to be about compromise. If you're really clever and smart about it, it can be one plus one equals three stuff. Yeah, it's just not being thoughtful or a lot of people, they just keep kicking that can on the road. They don't know what to do, and then they just hang in their job for another year, and then before you know it, they're at a point where they really can't enjoy the fruits of their labor. So uh, it's mostly just being very thoughtful and, and really thinking through things in a practical way. That's really helpful. And I know you have ways that you help people think about kind of joy and happiness and money and time. So I want to just let you share with people. I know just the terms that we're going to hear about that that I was so impressed with is can explain to people about the joy matrix. But then in terms of money, you have a work optional number and happiness per dollar. And then in time, you have concept of choice management, happiness per hour. These are all really relevant. So maybe we should start with the the joy matrix. Do you want to explain what that is to people? Of course. Thanks, Dory. So unless you'd rather start with the money, where do you want to start? <laughs> it's your book. <laughs> Let's start with joy. I like okay. That. Yeah. So if, there's, if you Google the word happiness, you'll see literally millions of hits. So it's a pretty nebulous term, and it's a pretty personal term. And you can spend a lot of time reading a lot of books and find out what makes other people happy or not. And that's useful. But what actually makes you happy? So My prudent shortcut to what makes you happy is this thing I came up with called the joy matrix. So some of you have these slides, some don't. So picture this matrix. And at the, there's two columns. There's six squares. The two columns at the top are things in your life that you must do. 
and things that are your choice. So everything in your life is something you got to do or you don't. And then down the side, the top is a little green smiley face, things that make you happy. At the bottom are the things that make you unhappy and in the middle, things are neutral. So the point is, you should be able to take everything in your life, and it's either something you got to do or you don't, and it's something that makes you happy or it doesn't. For example, can everyone right now think about what they were doing before this interview, what we were doing half an hour ago or whatever? So I want you to stop and think about that for a minute. What were you doing? Was it something you had to do or something that was your choice? And was it something that put a smile on your face, ultimately made you happy, or something that did not, or perhaps neutral? Okay, so hopefully you've, you've categorized this activity. And the, the point is, you can go through as deeply as you want and as many activities as you want and put them on this matrix. And it can be your weekday things, your weekend things. It can be your things now versus your things that might happen in your encore. And it's this continual reflection and awareness of, and obviously the things that are your choice, you would think would mostly be in upper part, upper quadrant, the things that make you happy. They don't always end up there, which is interesting. Something that makes you unhappy, but it's your choice. And then the things that are in the things you got to do, uh, you may not have to do them forever if they don't make you happy. And then th there's a lot of strategy involved of how do I move up the chart? How do I move more things into the, into the happy places, if you will? So that's the general concept is taking all the things you do in your life and put them on this, this matrix. Bye. That's so helpful. And you talk about that also in terms of relationships. I think it's a lot more interesting. Huh. Yeah, so there, there's people in your life that are in the required category, you know, family, what have you, your boss or co coworkers. And then there's obviously the, your choice people in your life, friends, et cetera, who puts in a smile on your face and who doesn't. And then there's always a follow-up issue, the when. And then sometimes people are smiling faces, sometimes they're not. And really, this is, then you have words that come into play that are critical in relationships. The words that come into play are responsibility, who are responsible for, who not. And certainly the responsible people are in the required category and the folks not. And then there's control is always a deep-seated issue of who's in control. Is it, am I dependent? Am I independent? Or have I hit the, the upper echelon of interdependence? So, Yes, you can use the joy matrix and analyze relationships and maybe make some changes. And what if people aren't really clear on what makes them happy in terms of either activities or relationships? Are there kind of ways that you suggest that they go about trying to figure it out? Or are there patterns or threads that you found that are important for people? Great question. So I'm, I've yet to get a little sciencey here. Happiness is neurochemicals. There's happy hormones and not so happy hormones. So that run through it. Oxytocin, serotonin, and, and endorphins, all these positive things. And then there, there's cortisol, negative stress hormones, etc. So basically what I'm suggesting is people put things in these squares on this, these, on this matrix, not always accurate. So I think they need to stop and look and really observe themselves thereafter and see if I gave you that really nice positive boost, good feeling or not. Yeah. So I think it, it's observing yourself is a big part of it. And sometimes what you think makes you happy does not. And uh, some people love golf and others, my God, I, I missed that putt on 18 and I had to turn over the $3 bet to the guy and, and it hangs with you. And maybe it wasn't that joyous. Others, that may not be the case. I, I think it's really truly reflecting on that day-to-day -day stuff, especially if you're Still work and really understanding yourself, what's driving your happiness or just unhappiness at work, and see if you can find something similar in your encore. What What are suggestions you have? Say somebody has some activities that don't 
bring them much joy or they have a lower rating. Have you found in your work with people that there are ways to shift some activities to get into a higher quadrant? That, that's the perfect question, Dory. Thank you. We'll start with the Your Choice column. So I think there's X number of things in the it's your choice that doesn't make you happy. Uh, watching the news at 11 o'clock at night, disrupting your sleep, getting upset about things you can't control, whether you feel responsibility for know what's going on in the world, may be the case, but yeah, just see that actually doesn't make sense. Maybe I'll just watch the news once a day or something. Yeah, so it's just certainly eliminating some things when you can eliminate, delegate, automate. There's a lot of things that we spend time doing that maybe there's alternatives. And sometimes intentionally procrastinating things is a way of getting them out of that bad quadrant. But a lot of it's strategic. Is It's your attitude and uh, the positive spin you put on things, the mental narratives we have. You can increase these categories. And if it's relationships, you know, if, if somebody's in the your choice column and it's not a positive thing, they're your choice. You can move on or maybe you can change relationship. The required relationships, we all have these, sometimes we have unresolved conflicts that weigh on us and so resolve the conflict or maybe a selective avoidance, so avoid people at certain times. Maybe it's on you. Maybe it's up to you to bring out the best in them and it's not just them. So it's thinking about it, being strategic about it and maybe crossing some things off the list. The really sad thing is I think a lot of retirees spend a lot more time watching TV and enjoying it a lot less. Yeah, so part of it is, uh, I guess, getting off the couch to some extent and being proactive and playing pickleball and what's going on here. I think you also mentioned in your book sometimes it could be trying new activities but with different people that like in a couple you don't always have to be joined at the hip and sometimes doing things with your partner if you're in a relationship or with other people might increase your joy quotient and so it doesn't have to be an all or none but just thinking about kind of activities relationships in terms of must do have to do and where that sense of responsibility and obligation fits in. I just think it's all really helpful and important to think about. And I know you you mentioned in your book there's some common happiness threads, the four Ps. Can you mention yeah. that? And, and this isn't original. I don't know if anybody's read. My wife gave me this marvelous book, The Blue Zones of Happiness ah, by Daniel right. Butner. Have you, you read it, Dory? Yeah, it's no. a wonderful book. And his work and studies are really wonderful. Yep. Yeah, so he did this. He's got this happiness test in there. And uh, there's three columns in the test. There's 30 questions. And the three columns are pleasure score, purpose score, and pride score. So he's done this international study, and that's what he concluded. And these are three major issues. And so certainly, I think daily pleasures, a cup of coffee in the morning, whatever it might be, I think these are huge. I think critical to day-to-day happiness. And obviously, pride in whatever you do things well, feel really good about it. The much more challenging, much more nebulous concept is this idea of purpose. And I know you have a lot of expertise there. And I know we've had Richard Leiter on your program a couple of times. So that's obviously much more challenging. But that's huge. And the purpose can come in many forms. Covering the grandkids, visiting such and such in the nursing home. It just doesn't always have to be joining the Peace Corps, which would be wonderful. I, I will say one thing I love about Richard is he's got all these marvelous books on purpose, but he also has this really perfect default purpose. And his default purpose is grow and give. So please, you really need to explore whatever your purpose may or should be. But I think if you have those two elements, they're huge. And... Honestly, the give part, I challenge people, do you know anyone who is truly happy who isn't somehow, some way, helping other people? <laughs> I, I think that's, uh, I don't know if you agree here, that's a story, but that, that's been my observation. Yeah. If you're not helping people somehow, you're probably not all that happy. I think that's such an important point of that giving back and that, that, that sense of sharing whatever your gifts are to other people in, in bigger or little ways. That's part of who we are, a legacy. I think it's important throughout life, but also very much in this next stage of life. Absolutely. Just holding the door for somebody, a smile from a stranger, which right. gives you a, 
that little boost of oxytocin or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Those are the free kind of things in terms of, of gratitude and forgiveness and niceness to people. Before we move on to the money part, any other kind of takeaways you would like people to have about the joy matrix? Yeah, you can in the book, it's on my website. Just you can you can spend some time in it and really put all your activities there, all the people in your life and really do some analysis. Or what I'm hoping at least at a minimum today, it's just a general mindset that you walk away with. Think about the joy matrix. Think that, oh, yeah, that's something I got to do. That's something I don't have to do. Something puts a smile on my face, something that doesn't. Continue to have this mindset on a daily basis and make appropriate changes. Great. That's really helpful. And I, I as I said, I really do recommend men glenn's book it really did bring a smile to my face and the music that i listened to and the smiling starfish too but let's shift now to the money part which i think constantly juggling i think joy money time so what's a good way to approach money how much money do we need to have for this next stage of life? How much money do people does one need to have for the future since we're living longer? How do you figure that all out? Okay, not easily. Well, there, there's I know there's been a lot of I think uh, Daniel Kahneman got a Nobel Prize and uh, people need seventy thousand dollars a year or something to be happy and that's probably gone up with inflation now. But in any case, yeah, there, there's a certain minimum amount of, of income we all need to cover life's basics adequate housing and safety and education and food and health care. Beyond that, I think people realize that more money is marginal in terms of happiness. In any case, what the right amount is for you is obviously a personal thing, and uh, but you have to do some math. You definitely have to roll up the sleeves, do some calculations, and I have this concept of your work optional number. And for those of you who don't have a slide, let me, uh, let me draw a picture. So we have this vertical axis and horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, we have money. On the horizontal axis, we have time. And basically, your money is growing over time. We start saving perhaps at a, hopefully at a young age. And it grows and grows. And there's this accumulation. Then you hit this peak where you don't have to work anymore if you don't want to. It's your work optional number. And then you start coming down the other side. You start spending and ultimately you hope the money lasts at least as long as you do. It's very important to understand, at least have a general idea of what this number is. If you don't know this number, it's pretty tough to make a really informed financial decision. There's insurance implications, estate implications, tax implications, giving implications, how aggressive to get with your portfolio implications. So I, I think it's really critical. I don't know how many people in the audience here know roughly what their quote unquote number is, but it's something that's very important that you do. So let me get into the details at least a little bit. And oh, by the way, if, if you don't have enough, obviously being happy is going to be a, going to be a struggle if you don't have that minimum. It's so stressful and a lot of folks, they, they cut it too close. The paycheck, and then something happens during their, it throws them a curve, and they don't have enough, and it really gets quite stressful. Obviously, if at all possible, try to keep a nice cushion there, mitigate stress. It gets particularly problematic if it's a part, you have a partner, and one is a minimalist, and the other one's a maximalist. So that gets a little tricky, a little reconciliation. In any case, let me uh, talk about it's all about cash flows when it comes to money. So during the working years, as you're kind of going up and accumulating, you have your income, you have expenses, and hopefully your income is greater than your expenses, and you have net savings. And the savings are invested, and hopefully it grows and grows, and then, again, you get to this point, and where do you have enough to call it quits? your work optional number. So once you retire, you should have certain set levels of income coming in, maybe Social Security, maybe a pension. And then here's the question. Unless you're going to have additional part-time pay to fill the void, 
if your Social Security and pension are less than your outflows, money's got to come from somewhere. I guess it has to come out of your portfolio. So the question is, how large does your portfolio need to be to not run out of money over, over your remaining years? That's your work optional number. So let me give you a, a simple example. Let's assume that your Social Security and pension each year is going to be $40,000 a year. Let's also assume that you're spending about $5,000 a month, $60,000 a year. So you got 40 coming in, you have 60 going out, you're short $20,000. So how much money do you have to have in, a, in savings to be able to pull out $20,000 a year for the rest of your life? So the industry has this 4% rule of thumb that you can take out 4% every year. If you take 4% and you divide it into 100, you get 25. So if I take 25 and I multiply it times $20,000, in my example, you need $500,000. So again, if you've got 40 coming in pension, Social Security, you have 60 going out in expenses, you need to take 20 out of your portfolio. Your portfolio, based on my 4% rule of thumb, needs to be $500,000. Now, I have a rule of thumb, and that is I don't like rules of thumb. <laughs> They're a little dangerous. And, and that 4% rule is probably there, there's some inherent assumptions in there that are probably not the best. But... Right now, I just want to conceptually give you an idea of a work optional number. So if you don't have those savings, you're going to have to fill up that void somehow, either with part-time work, maybe reduced lifestyle. I'm not sure how you're going to fill the void, but you need to have an idea of what your cash flows are going to be once you retire. Can you mention, you mentioned about some of the assumptions it's based on is it all is it uh, are these assumptions based on the longevity that people now have because i know you talked earlier and i think a fear that many people have is not outliving their money so how does one fact how do you deal with these assumptions and to get more realistic with yourself because it may have to do with whether or not you can afford to retire or as you say, whether or not you need to be bringing some additional money in. How do people make yeah. those? Yeah, go ahead. No, that, that, that's perfect, Tori. So let me tell you about the 4% rule of thumb. It's basically based on somebody who's 65, who's going to live for 30 years, and who gets historical rates of return. So if you're younger or older and you don't get historical rates of return, it's problematic. So I don't want to ruin anyone's day today, but I'd rather not. Worse than that would be to ruin your future by you using bad assumptions. So here's a suggestion in terms of appropriate rates of return. Every year, Morningstar in January puts out a quote-unquote experts forecast, 10-year forecast. And you can go to Morningstar. You can look this up. And again, Google Morningstar experts forecast 2022. And in it, you'll see a table of forecast by Morningstar, Vanguard, if you can't trust them, who can you trust, and other firms. And you can see a table. And I don't want to ruin your day, but if you're the traditional 60% U.S. stocks, 40% U.S. bonds, it doesn't look very good. It looks like you'll be lucky to beat inflation, and it might be a wild ride to get that. I strongly suggest you take a look at those forecasts. I think they're fairly – there's no – no precision here. There, there's an old Robert quote, class quote. There's only two kinds of forecasters. Those who don't know and those who don't know, they don't know. So, again, take things with a grain of salt. But still, the consensus says that basic math, that your traditional portfolio, and that's what the 4% rule of thumb is based on. So I think a 3% rule might be better, which means a multiple of 33 and a higher number. So use realistic assumptions 
And I don't think that historical returns, at least for the next 10 years, are likely. There's some things going the other way. Some assumptions that people use I see continually that I think are also erroneous. For example, people often assume that what they spend in their 60s and 70s, that they'll have the energy to spend the same amount in their 80s and 90s. And then I realize for some folks costs go up with medical or whatever, but very often they're overestimating what they're likely to spend in, in those in the golden years. That's one assumption. Another assumption I continually see that I think is overly conservative is there's an inheritance out there. And they don't want to be altruistic, if you will, or ask about it, but I know it's there and they ignore it, but it's real. They're going to get an inheritance. They should factor that in. Another major assumption that people tend to ignore, they're overly conservative, is equity in their home. If they never tap the equity they have in their home, assume they own it, they're going to lead less of a lifestyle than they could have. So now how you actually tap the equity, move to a less expensive area of the country, take out a conventional mortgage, take out a reverse mortgage, rent, I'm not sure how, but that's a very valuable asset, especially given the rise in real estate, especially in Massachusetts. So that's an asset that people tend to ignore. So those are three big issues. And also there's a false sense of security that people have. A lot of advisors will do Monte Carlo simulations, which I think are terrific, but they're only as good as the underlying assumptions inside the Monte Carlo simulations. And a lot of times those are based on historical returns. So who's ever using that software really should, I think, dial it back to a lower expected return. So I'm kind of going on and on here, but it's critical to use appropriate assumptions. And go ahead, George. No, that's, it's really helpful. So that leads me to think about what advice do you give? Should people try to handle money themselves or hire an advisor? And how would, if one decided to hire an advisor, what would be ways to find a trustworthy one who will add value rather than create more hardship? Yeah, that's really a tricky question. And maybe one last comment on the money piece, and that is I have this concept of happiness per dollar. Oh, yeah. Speak about that. That would be really helpful. Yeah, that's a very positive thing. So what I have people do, and and couples too, independently, I'll have them go through their budget and put a little smiley face or a frown next to the expenditures. Which ones actually drive their happiness and which ones do not? And then a couple should do it independently, and then they should reconcile and see. And very often, if you're smart about it and you're going back to the joy matrix, very often people can find out that the they can reduce their outflows and actually be happier. I know that sounds like pie in the sky, but if you think of the things that, that really drive our day-to-day happiness, most of them have almost no cost at all. Hugging's been tough during COVID, but the oxytocin and dopamine through celebrating wins, completing tasks, and then serotonin, you know, meditating, walk in nature, get a little exercise in, endorphins, laughing, all these sort of dark chocolate, all these wonderful things, all these little things are pretty much no cost. And they're the ones that are going to drive your happiness. I'm remembering this cartoon I saw someplace. And there's this guy who's on his deathbed. And his whole family's surrounding him. And they're all just waiting on dad's last words. And the last thing he says is, I should have bought more crap. That's obviously a huge sarcasm. But in any case, think again, if you're really self-reflective, I think in many cases you can really reduce your outflows and maybe even increase your happiness as a result. And remember, if you can reduce your outflows, then that work optional amount is that much smaller. I digress. No, that's, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought, that's part of that realistic optimism to recognize that it's not, it's, it's that whole shift from maybe doing so much to being and some of the, the gratitude and the simple free pleasures in life, being outside, nizing, those are, that's part of the time, that's part of the joy, and it really should be factored in happiness per dollar. You don't have to spend money on a lot of those things, so. If at all. But if back to the other question I had, then we'll move to time and then I will integrate some of the questions that people are raising. What is your advice about handling money oneself or hiring someone and how do you 
find somebody who's trustworthy. I know one of your handouts is about 10 toughest questions to ask an advisor, but I'd like you to expand a little here, if you would. Yeah, story. It's like everything else. It's balancing time, money, and joy. It's, if you're not going to hire the advisor, will you actually find the time to do what needs to be done? And it's not that the advisor is going to do it, everything anyway. There's a lot of things you're still going to have to do yourself. You know, really, the ongoing issue is your probably your portfolio. So will you find the time to do it or not? Money. Is the advisor a good investment or not? Are they going to add value in excess of their cost? And if you're, I don't know what kind of advisor you'd probably see, a big fan of commission-based, but if you're an advisor and they're charging 1% a year or whatever, are they going to add value in excess of the 1%? If not, 1% is meaningful. That's real money. And then there's the happiness piece. And I don't know if some people it's just spending a lot of their retirement years and they love getting up every day and with their investments. Others, it's a very stressful thing and they'd rather have someone else do it. So it's a time, money, and joy. And the number one word is, is trust. And can you find an advisor you can trust? And if not, do you trust yourself? Do you trust your spouse if you have one to handle these financial matters? These are the, the key questions. And if you're – the characteristics an advisor, which aren't always easy to discern, that you really want, I talk about the three C's. Do they have genuine concern for you? Do they – are they calm? You want you – know, the big reason to hire an advisor is probably somebody who's unemotional, concerned, calm, and you better have conviction. If you hit tough markets, he needs to need that, that steady hand at the tiller, if you will. Yeah, and how do you find these folks? You can take my, my, my webinar classes. I've been teaching them for several years now, Council of Aging Groups and Community Education, et cetera. I can get more specific, but there's organizations that are out there that, again, I'm, I'm biased towards the relatively unbiased, the only advisors. I think the commission folks, it gets a little challenging in any case. I'm not sure if that's helpful. I think that's very helpful, and I think you had said that on your website there's resources and information, too, of finding fee-only advisors, you were saying, or holistic advisors, people who look at the money and how you want it to work for you, part of that joy, happiness part of it, and the issue of time. But let's, in terms of the issue of time, because I'm just looking at my clock here, you in terms of time, you, and I want to integrate some of the questions from people here, you talk about, what would you like to say about time? I know you talk about happiness per hour, and maybe you can talk about that and how it changes pre and post retirement or pre and post encore stage of life. Yeah, so it's ironic. We're running out of time for time here, but in any case, just a couple of quick comments. Number one, it's cruel. During the working years, there's not enough time, and you want to, what little time you have that's discretionary, you want it to be as happy as possible. And then, then the irony is, once you're retired, and many times it's just too much time, and I uh, have things to get up for in the morning, and it's just way too much time. So it, it, it's unfair. That's how it often works out. The other key parts are, as I mentioned earlier, you, if you don't plan your time, very often somebody else will, and uh, such and such is working. So you may end up getting pulled into things like joining condo boards and things that maybe you don't. That's important. Another major issue is it's really not time management. It is choice management. You know, so if you keep that, if you're very cognizant of it, and I think there's a book out there by Anne Lamont, and I think that the title of the book is No is a Complete Sentence. <laughs> but, right. I think the word no is, is so liberating, and to be able to say that confidently, no, nope, can't do it. So those are a couple of points. But And then the final point is there's only 24 hours in a day, and it's our very most precious commodity, and not to stress out about it, but be thoughtful with your time. Don't let the days just happen to you. Be intentional. Mm. I think that's so important of the idea of – I like your idea of time management, but think about it as choice management and kind of – knowing that you can claim your own time and recognize that it doesn't have to be by default, that you can design how you want to use your own time. I think that's so important. I want to integrate some of these questions now. Of course. Uh, so Kathleen from Belmont says, you may have said a few things about it, but I want to just honor the question. So what is the way to balance concern to protect savings for old age and enjoy savings in early retirement without excessive worry? 
How do you think this question of balance without letting too much emotion get in the way of clear thinking? Or how to think about this question of balance without letting too much emotion get in the way of clear thinking? Yeah, that comfort level always comes in the math. And, and again, if, if you know what that work optional number is, if you're above that number, your lifestyle is always covered. You've done some reasonable calculations. That should give you some comfort level. And you need to anticipate, uh, unless you can afford to keep all your money in, in, in the bank and earn 1% or less, you have to accept that there will be some time periods where you're going to lose money. And this year could definitely be one of them. I don't know. Yeah, so it's a – and don't look at your portfolio every day. That, that, that's doing a real disservice to people that are looking at it on a daily basis. You know, what kind of a information theory. Information doesn't help you. It's probably a deterrent. Yeah, so really – and this in the media doesn't help. Who did this today? The Dow did that yesterday. How many points – the news is just, yeah, you know, turn off the news. I don't think you or not, but you got to do some math and maybe have some safety hedges. And maybe Kathleen has a home equity in her home in Belmont. I don't know. And maybe that's a marvelous fallback position in case her portfolio goes south and that buys a number of years. And, yeah, so, I again, think of the math and tune out all, all this lousy noise. Great. Thank you. And Warren from Pennsylvania says, how do you manage sharing your level of wealth with your children and keep them focused on growing their careers and their wealth? Over-communicating may be confusing to them, particularly if you and your spouse may be spending more of your wealth. Additionally, so the two parts of this, how can advisors be utilized productively to help them, children, accept the wealth you ultimately share with them or is keeping everything siloed best? Oh, that, that's, that's, Warren, that's a marvelous question. And I think I addressed it in the book, one of the chapters. I'm going to plug my book again here. Yeah, I, I think that my observation has been that parents overestimate the negative impact on their child's character. I think their characters are often set fairly early on, their teens and early 20s. And the fact that they may get some large amount of money, they might be surprised it doesn't change things all that much. Now, if there's a spouse involved, a daughter or son-in-law, you have to factor that into the equation. But basically, the short answer is, I think being relatively open with it. And if you treat the children differently, though, I wouldn't be all that open. I think that just causes a lot of discord and harm. But I, I think being fairly open with it, and I think that the, the quote I have from a client, I want my children to have enough money that they can do anything they want, but not so much money that they don't want to do anything at all. Yeah, so understand your child's character, and you've observed them over the years, and maybe baby steps. You make the annual gifting or whatever, see how they react with it. Sometimes if you have children that you're really worried about, that, that a large amount of money may ruin their lives potentially, then I think a slow inheritance makes sense. Pay off their mortgage, maybe they buy an immediate annuity, something. Yeah, so the advisor should navigate Warren through all these issues in some reasonable fashion. And I think it's crucial that the advisor, it's a whole family thing. Somebody, uh, the advisor or an underling of the advisor kind of deals directly with the children. So it all fits together. But in general, I think relatively open communication makes sense and, and maybe start off with something smaller and see what the reaction is. That's a great response. Thank you, Glenn. Let's see. The next one is a comment, which I think is a nice example of what you're talking about, from Judy in Weymouth. She says, I've been, quote, retired for almost 17 years. The best advice I received after that to pay off my mortgage before retiring and investing for over 30 years along the way. For the first six months after retiring, making no long-term commitments, just be, if you feel like taking a nap at 11, do it. If something doesn't get done today, it can be done tomorrow. Give yourself time to unwind and recover. Then when something comes up, you'll be ready. I followed this advice and it worked wonderfully. After four months, a friend approached me and said, I need someone to. That started me into a part-time position, which led to others. After 16 years at age 73, I'm, quote, fully retired, meaning the connections I have isn't for pay and I can say no thanks at any time. I think Judy should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe I'll, the, the paying off the mortgage, I think, actually, for a lot of folks, that's their very best investment today is to pay off debt, maybe even their mortgage, I think. And then they don't have the pressure of that monthly payment. And I'm not sure the tax savings. 
given what the standard deduction is today is all that great. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly paying other debts off of higher interest rates, it, again, is maybe your very best investment because I don't think that whatever you used to pay it off with is likely to have tremendous returns going forward. I don't want them to take money out of retirement accounts to do that. If it, they don't have to incur taxes to pay off debts, I think that's a marvelous thing. Great. Thank you. So Carol from Wilmington was wondering, are the numbers based on individual monthly expenses? What if it's a couple? Is it double or cost of living expenses as a couple may not double, but maybe 70% due to economies? Or what's your, how do you figure this out in terms of individuals and couples? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, often it's a function of when they got married. So the early in marriage has always been joint. The later marriage, often it's the money never really gets married, if you will. And it depends on how they think about it. The numbers I calculated were, I guess, if, it, it's a, if it's a couple, that was a couple's numbers, a couple's combined savings. And if they have joint expenses, really don't think about the expenses as his and hers, then it's separate calculations. But yeah, and obviously joint expenses should be less than the total of individual expenses in that shared housing and all these sorts of things. I don't know if I'm answering the question very well or not, but, and this gets complicated. Maybe this is the reason you hire somebody to do these calculations for you. There are folks out there, most people are looking to manage your investments, which you may or may not want, but they're, and actually I'll give you the name of a group, the XY Planning Network is a group that would do the financial calculations and not require that they manage your money and not sell your products. Can this you happens. say the resource again? The XY Planning Network. XY Planning Network, okay. Yeah, so there's very few ways of finding folks that aren't selling products and or looking to manage your money. Not that the latter is a bad thing, but... No, that's really helpful. And the final question before you tell people how to get access to your email and, I mean, your website and all of that and other final takeaways. But Stuart from California says, is there a benefit for FIN advisors using retirement coaches to give a 360 degree to help other clients? I'm a retirement coach and thus the interest. Oh, absolutely. I think that there's all these financial issues is so interrelated. Gifting, estate, insurance, Funding grandchildren is 529. All these sorts of things are just very interrelated. So somebody who takes a very holistic 360 view, I think it is, and I can't imagine that, that it's rare that an individual can handle all these things in an integrated fashion on their own. So I think particularly in those situations, an advisor with a 360 view is very beneficial and likely to add value far in excess of their cost, I would think. Great. So, Glenn, this has been wonderful. Would you tell people again about your book, your website, how to reach you, resources? And I know, you know, you're going to be part of the Encore Boston Network with a lot of programs. And I know you have financial workshops coming up with them and maybe other workshops. Can you tell people about that? And then, and then we'll end with a takeaway that you want people to hold on to. Terrific. So I'm involved with Encore Boston Network, and Dory and I are both listed in their service directory. There's only a few people listed there, so right. I know that EBN with Doug Dixon, uh, Doug and Dory uh, know each other for a long time, as she mentioned earlier. So really a terrific local organization, and they're one of the places I've listed for resources. I'm not sure anyone's resources are extensive as Dory's if you go on her website, but my own firm, Lexington Wealth Management, and I'm very proud of LWM very holistic, the heart and head of wealth management. One of the founders, Chris Picaro, has had for now for several years, every the second Tuesday of every month, she does a lunchtime Empower Women series. Lots mm -hmm. of very topics, some financial, some not. If there's anything positive about COVID and there isn't much, it's that guys like me have been able to attend these things because everything's virtual. At Lexington Wealth Management, we have ongoing events. This is free to the public. And it's financial topics, and it's just an Empower Women series. So that's going on. We have some other events coming up throughout the year at Lexington. I teach at Community Education, Lexington, Acton, et cetera. I'll probably have some other workshops coming up with the Encore Boston Network. I don't have anything scheduled yet, but I will have some things. I always do educational webinars for the Financial Planning Association of Massachusetts. I do webinars for NAPA, 
National Association of Personal Financial Advisors. And I often do this whole, what's your encore and how to integrate time management and happiness into the actual financial planning process. I'm trying to get some other, many other advisors to put this in the equation to, to maximize family happiness, not just numbers. So I've got that going on. As Dory mentioned, we have these 10 toughest questions to ask an advisor. And we're talking about some tough questions, just the ones that, that may, may give you some real insight into the firm you're considering dealing with. Yeah, that's pretty. And so your website is a real key place for people to go to find out about all these workshops and the resources. And, and that is one of the silver linings of COVID, that things are on Zoom now and open open to interested people, even if you don't live locally. So I think that's really terrific. So any final, again, I want to just thank you so much, but any final kind of takeaway you want people to leave with before we close for today? Yeah, I guess just uh, hoping today, just a couple of mindsets, ongoing decisions. Gee, there's probably a trade-off between time, money, and joy. Be cognizant of that. Be cognizant of the joy matrix. Get value for your time, happiness per hour. Get value for your money, happiness per hour. And don't worry so much. I didn't get the same today, Dory, but that's okay. Great. Slow down. Go too fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that is, again, just to mention part of the wonderful part of his book where there's these YouTube links to listen to all these songs. And it, it is it does slow you down and get you smiling. So I can speak from experience having read the book. So thank you so much for being here today. And thank you, everybody who's been listening. And uh, everybody stay well and safe. Take care. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com.